Welcome to The Holy Post. From the Jesus movement in the 70s, through the religious right in the 80s, the rise of new Calvinism in the 90s, and the MAGA movement today, as a Christian kid in the suburbs and then a political journalist in Washington, D.C., John Ward has had a front seat to the most significant characters and events in American evangelicalism. He talks to me today about his new autobiography, Testimony, and why he is still a committed Christian despite the failure of the movement that raised him. Also this week, early data shows a reduction in the number of abortions since the Supreme Court overturned Roe, but it's a lot less than many people predicted. The so-called independent prophets are back at it again, predicting that God's going to kill a bunch of Donald Trump's opponents next month. Why are they still supporting him when there are new alternatives? And a report finds that advocates of Christian nationalism are more rooted in cultural heritage than Christian theology. Is anyone really surprised? At this point, I usually tell you what exciting new bonus feature we have this week exclusively for Holy Post supporters, but I have a bit of a problem because we just have too much great content to share and I don't have time to cover it all. We've got a new Christian Asks about hell, a bonus interview with John Ward about journalism, Old Testament scholar Carmen Imes explains why posting the Ten Commandments in public violates the Ten Commandments, and that's not even all of it. We have so much bonus material, we've really stepped up our bonus game here at the Holy Post. So here's what I want you to do. Go to holypost.com and sign up for our new free newsletter. It's super easy, and that way you'll stay on top of all the great new stuff we're creating beyond our weekly show. And while you're there, be sure to click the Support Us link at the top of the page. You won't regret it, I promise. Okay, here is episode 561. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. This is Phil Vischer. You're listening to the Holy Post Podcast. I am here with Christian Taylor. Hi, Christian. Hello, Phil. Good to see you. Good to see you. And Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. Sky's not in the Death Star. Where are you, Sky? I'm in the other Death Star. I am in the official Holy Post office. Hmm. Hmm. It's, it's weird that the world of the Empire is entirely black and white. Was that George saying they don't see nuance? Uh, maybe. For people who are just listening to this, they don't realize that there are stormtroopers behind me. So yeah. That, yeah. that's why you're referencing. Yeah. It's like the Empire is following you. No matter where you go. It is. The dark side is always with me. Uh, I think the stormtroopers, though, were meant to be like skeletons. They were supposed to look like skeletons. Really? Yeah. Okay. But what about the the big uh, star cruisers? Those were all white. They are gray. Oh, okay. I like your I like your take on it, Phil. It's very interesting. Yeah, thank adds you. another dynamic. Thank so you. I, I'm gonna well, say that uh, whether the they s- intended it or not, what, it's actually a good analogy. Didn't nope. Yoda? Wasn't Yoda the one who said that absolutes are Sith uh, deal in absolute? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it was some other Jedi who said that, but mm-hmm. no, it was Yoda. But he may have been quoting an older Jedi from like the. The Augustan of Jedi from way back in <laughs> early Jedi history. Okay, time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. Today's episode is sponsored by Blue Land. Did you know we throw away an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning product bottles every year? And lots of that plastic ends up in our water supply so that each of us are eating roughly a credit card's worth of plastic each week. Yuck, I don't want to eat plastic. Blue Land is on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic. Their idea is simple. They offer endlessly refillable cleaning products with a beautiful design that looks great on your counter. Just fill the bottles with water, drop in Blue Land tablets, and wait for them to dissolve. You'll never ever have to buy giant bottles of cleaning supplies again. From cleaning sprays to hand soap, toilet bowl cleaner, and laundry tablets, all Blue Land products are made with clean ingredients you can feel good about. And Blue Land has an offer just for Holy Post listeners. Get 15% off your first purchase of any product. To get 15% off your first order, go to blueland.com slash holy post. You won't want to miss this. blueland.com slash holy post. That's blueland.com slash Holy Post, and thanks to Blue Land for sponsoring this episode. 
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Holy Post podcast. Hope you're having a great week. We uh, here in the Chicago suburbs went from 80 degrees to 30 degrees in 48 hours. So that was fun. Woke up with snow on the ground this morning, and we were all out in shorts and T-shirts two days ago. <laughs> My daffodils and tulips are very sad. Their heads are hanging oh, no. a little. I'm worried they're going to not make it. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, a couple of days ago, I was thinking, man, I should have planted the tomatoes, gotten them started a little early this year. I'm like, oh, glad I did it. Yeah. G- glad I did it. Okay. Um, speaking of nuts and berries and flowers and tomatoes, Lance Wallnow was in the news. Remember who Lance Wallnow is? Mm-hmm. I think you need to refresh my memory. Yeah, he's he's one of the... We, we did an episode on the New Apostolic Reformation and the whole world of independent prophets. Prophets, YouTube prophets, and yeah, it was a whole, it was a whole thing. And one of the key, I guess, thinkers in that movement recently, more recently, has been Lance Wallnow, who's not associated with any church or denomination or any organization whatsoever, entirely freelance, but he was a, a student of the guy who started the movement, whose name escapes me. Anyway, you all know who I'm talking about, and you can yell out his name. He was the Fuller Seminary professor that— Is it w- Wagner? Yeah, Peter yeah. C. Peter Wagner. Right. Yeah, so he was a student of his. Lance Wallnow is the one who, who popularized the idea that Donald Trump was Cyrus, was a Cyrus figure— Mm -hmm. Uh, being raised up to, we're still not exactly sure what, get us out of exile, uh, um, send us back to the promised land. For those who don't know that reference of a Cyrus reference, and I'm using air quotes, why don't you explain? Yeah, the the Old Testament um, biblical figure, the king of Persia, who who, uh, let the Israelites return to the promised land. Even though he wasn't a a, a God-fearing Jew, God used him, used, and that's that's Trump because he's not a God-fearer, but God used him, a secular real estate developer, to deliver us back to the promised land? Yeah, one added nuance there, Phil, is Cyrus is spoken of as being anointed by God, which is, oh. the, is the Hebrew word Messiah, <gasps> means, to, means anointed one. So Cyrus yeah. is called a Messiah— Anointed by God to free his free God's people from from exile, and that's the metaphor that got carried forward for Trump. Is yeah, yeah, he's probably not a believer, but he's nonetheless anointed by God for divine purposes, and therefore he should be supported by Christians. That's kind of the, okay. the logic yeah. of it all. What he said. So, right. anywho, back to Lance. Lance the turtle. That's the Veggie Tales reference. Post bankruptcy, I wasn't involved. Um, Lance said recently, it looks to me like there could be some sudden deaths coming in May. The month of May, sudden deaths. April That's showers. <laughs> April showers bring May massacres. What's I mean, what what does he mean? In May Death of <laughs> in May, we're going to see the dis- disciplinary hand of God coming down on those who stand in the way of what he wants to do through Donald Trump. So people are opposing Donald Trump, like, for example, maybe taking Donald Trump to court, putting oh. Donald Trump on trial, generally standing in the way of Donald Trump. And, and according to Lance Wall now, in the month of May, some of those people are going to start dropping dead. Isn't that really dangerous rhetoric? Because someone listening to him might think, oh, well, then I have permission to be the angel of death and go kill these people? No, that's ridiculous. How would anyone be so far out that they would do something crazy Mm -hmm. just because of following someone who's kind of crazy? Not good. Not good. Let's just don't bring up the January 6th riots because it seems like a very close parallel. Nothing crazy. I just don't, don't understand why... If you're if you're in that little group of prophets that were all in on Trump four years ago or two years ago, and then he lost, and then like, oh well, we were wrong. Why are you doubling down? Why aren't you just saying I was wrong? And you know, Trump isn't the only person who can help our cause. What I'm not even sure what their cause is at this point, other than seeing their prior prophecies fulfilled. What what is the cause? 
cognitive dissonance won't allow them to admit wrong. We've talked yeah. about this before, right? Yeah. Right. Um, th- and that's, yeah, that's why they say the election was stolen. They were right. Right. He did get elected. Exactly. So um, Leon Festinger is the sociologist who came up with the term cognitive dissonance. He he was at Stanford. You just pulled that right out of your I know. Career that's, that's impressive. <laughs> These are things I know, <laughs> random facts. But it all came from, he was studying this uh, apocalyptic cult who thought that the world was going to end in a cataclysmic flood, but that they were going to be rescued by a bunch of aliens. This is in mm-hmm. 1954, 56, something like that. Obviously, when the flood didn't happen, when the world survived, he went and interviewed all these cult members and asked them, what do you, how are they reconciling the fact that they had this belief, but it didn't happen? And very, very few of them ever admitted that they were wrong or that they had been duped by their cult leader. Instead, they came up with the excuse that, well, because we obeyed our cult leader and did everything right, we actually prevented the end of the world. Mm -hmm. And so when someone believes something so firmly, they can't entertain the possibility that they're wrong. They will come up with some kind of logical contortions to continue to persist in their wrong belief. And that's exactly what's going on here with this new apostolic movement and all the Donald Trump craziness is they've been wrong over and over and over and over again, but they just come up with another new prophecy that explains, well, this is why, or here's what really happened, or now that... And even if they know they're full of crap, they're not going to admit it because they're making too much money through YouTube views and other things, and they can't come out as a charlatan. So they have to go down this nonsense road even further. And I'm not saying that's what... Walnow is doing, but there's a lot of incentive to not admit wrong here, and both psychological and, and economic. You don't think he's going down the nonsense road? I think he's going down the nonsense road. He is. Road. I am saying why he's going down it. I can't oh, know. Okay. It, it could be psychological. It could be economic. There's many reasons. Will, but. It, will it take like one more loss? Like, okay, they all managed to get Trump nominated again. He loses again. And then they say, okay, maybe we should move on to no. a new messiah. No. No. Mm-mm. I do I do wonder this. They are everybody is like, "Oh, Donald Trump is elected. He is the one to lead us. He is God's anointed." Mm-hmm. And I can understand that coming maybe from the idea that God is in control of things and he, you know, allows things to happen either he causes them to happen or he allows them to happen for our good to accomplish his purposes. But what do they do when someone else is in office? Right? I mean, what do we he's, do with that? He's not God's anointed. He So he then took they're the, saying the devil is is yeah. the one that no, put Biden what, God's judgment. God withheld God is withholding his hand of of blessing on us because of drag queen story hour. So that's why Biden won the election. God allowed it to happen to chasten us. And then once we turn back to God, then Trump will win again and the drag queens will go away. But don't they realize that this has been said almost about every Republican president since I don't know who. This is our, you know, victor. I mean, they said it about Reagan. He yep. is God's anointed. This is our time. Uh-huh. Said it about Nixon. Uh-huh. So, what's your point? There's always a market for this, Christian. <laughs> yeah. What's your What is your Nothing new nothing under, new under the, the sun. sun. Same song. Second verse, fiftieth verse, fifteenth verse. Okay, I figure because you know we don't want to we don't want to court controversy. So I figure this week we should talk about uh, Trump, abortion, and Christian nationalism. Okay, does that sound good? So we just don't so fun. Don't get ourselves into any trouble. The the trifecta. Let's do it. (laughs) Can't wait to see Twitter this week. Okay, legal abortions in U.S. down 5,000 per month since the end of Roe. We finally, we talked about this, uh, uh, I think at the end of last year, one of our predictions for this year was we would find out whether the overturning of Roe did what it was hoped, Mm -hmm. uh, did what uh, the Guttmacher Institute predicted. And by the way, the Guttmacher Institute, which is a pro-choice organization that tracks um, abortion in the U.S. more closely than just about anybody else. They predicted uh, that if Roe was overturned, there might be as much as a 12% reduction in abortion in the U.S., but no more than that. And a lot of people said, what? 
What do you mean only 12%? We're going to get rid of abortion. So anyway, it was overturned. Abortion, or or Roe was overturned. In the six months since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, there were 5,377 fewer abortions on average per month, according to a new report. The average number of terminations from July through December was 77,073, a 7% drop from the average in April through May. So... Not a 12% drop like Guttmacher estimated, a 7% drop. This was pretty widely celebrated on conservative Christian Twitter of saying, see, see, look, we're winning. Trump helped us, and now there's fewer abortions. Um, I did point out that, well, the estimate was that there would be much more of a reduction, and that made some people mad at me, of of course, because— I don't know why. Well, and the other, I don't think this is in the article, but the other fact that is helpful to keep in mind here is abortions have fallen. The abortion rate has fallen pretty much every year and every administration since Reagan in the 1980s, except it started going up under Donald Trump. So yeah. it isn't like there was an upward slope and then suddenly Roe was overturned and it went down. It's been going down for 40 years. Yeah, yeah. But this this drop is obviously yes. due to uh, the, there were 96% fewer abortions in a handful of states, the right. ones that had laws that immediately went into effect. And the and, argument from Guttmacher and other places was if Roe were overturned, some states would outlaw abortion completely, but other states would make up for it by making it more available or easier access or by accommodating women coming from partner uh, neighboring states that don't allow it. So that's why they came up with their 10 to 12% figure because it wasn't going to dramatically overturn the rate, but it would reduce it in some places and it would go up in other places. So that's yeah. what you get. And to continue that, immediately after Roe, I think on our first episode where we talked about Roe being overturned, um, one of us, I don't know if it was me, if it was you, if it was Christian, I don't know, who expressed the concern that, okay, this is good because the decision can go back to the states and we're in support of, of the decision going back to the states and also eliminating um, the, the very liberal guideline that there could be no ban or no restriction of abortion before, you know, week 23 or, or something like that, whereas much of Europe, it's, it's before 15 weeks. Um, so we were in, generally in support of that. The con, one of the concerns was, you know, it'll hit um, the poorest women the hardest, right? Because wealthy women can travel much more easily, can t- get time off work, have childcare. It'll affect poorest women the hardest, and that appears to be the case. Um, the average American now lives 275 miles further from an abortion facility than before the decision, and black and indigenous women are experiencing the largest increase in, in travel time. So that's accurate. That's not a justification for abortion to say, well, everyone needs to have it if it's going to you know, affect uh, non-white women the most to not have it. No, not a justification for abortion, but to point out that it's hitting poor women the hardest. Secondly, we said one of the, the concerns was that there wasn't just a movement to, to turn the decision back to the states, but now there was a movement to try to ban it outright, to try to ban interstate travel for abortion, to try to ban um, medication abortions from being sent across state lines, which is exactly what we're seeing happen. And, and the concern that we raised was that that kind of overreach usually comes with a backlash. And the backlash could actually slow down the improvement in you know, declining abortion rates um, as states go out of their way to fight against the restrictions or what they see as a conservative overreach. And I think it's fair to say that we're seeing that too. Um, quite a bit of backlash. We saw it in the midterm elections. We just saw it in Wisconsin in the, in the race for the open seat on the Supreme Court that um, it's very likely Wisconsin will now have more access to abortion than they had a month ago because of the backlash uh, to some of the, the conservative, more extreme laws that have been passed. So Christian, Sky, thoughts, what do you think six months after Roe, looking back, and particularly with the push for you know ever more restrictive laws, um, what's going to happen? Go for it, Christian. 
No, you go on ahead, boy. <laughs> I have a thought, but it doesn't answer his question. So okay. you go first. Um, a couple things. Number one, from the polling I've seen, the vast majority of Americans are not in support of flat-out bans on abortion. Mm-hmm. At the same time, most most Americans don't believe in unrestricted abortion either. They're somewhere in the middle. So if you want to take the extreme position of the Republican Party or the extreme position of the Democratic Party, you're going to miss where most of the electorate is. That being said, I don't think it's an impossibility for a state to pass legislation or to elect leaders who have very restrictive views on abortion. I think it is possible, but I think the way to do it, and here I am, you know, a political genius. I think the way to do that is if you're going to step in and say, we're doing a six-week ban or we're going to have some very severe restrictions on abortion, you also need to couple that with, here's what we're going to do to support more poor families. Here's what we're going to do to make sure that more families have access to affordable health care. Here's what we're going to do to make sure that preschool and other early childhood developmental things are available to low-income families. Here's what we're going to do to make sure that those children who are born are cared for and equipped and those families are well-resourced. That's, I think, a winning formula to say, we care about pregnant women, we care about the poor, and we care about these kids, which is why we are both pro-life when it comes to abortion and we're going to be pro-life when it comes to helping them get raised in a healthy environment. I think more Americans are willing to vote for that platform than the one that just says abortion anytime you want for any reason or no abortion for anybody at all. But I don't know who's really making that holistic case. So we'll see. Right. Christian, what are your thoughts? Well, I have a question for you, really. Um, So what I'm wondering is, with this new positive news out of the, you know, less abortions, do the Republicans and you know feel like we can celebrate this now and we uh, we've our mission has been accomplished. We are seeing abortion rates decrease. And now we no longer need to use this as a scare tactic to get people to uh, give and donate money and Christian or <laughs> or or has they just had that just like Christian, you know Christian, yeah. is there still yeah. abortion in America? Yes, there is. Uh huh. Yeah. So no. so so Stop. what they're sa- they're not going to stop using that as a fear tactic to raise money and elect officials until there is no more abortion at all yeah, in the United States. I, w- I wouldn't I wouldn't describe it as a fear tactic. I would just describe it as a motivating moral issue. You know, because it's not it's not like abortion is coming to your house to kill your dog. Well, no, that's not true. You know, we all know that's immigrants, not abortion. So yes, but. I have seen emails in my father's inbox about yeah. using, you know, in my these father's tactics. inbox are many emails. <laughs> <laughs> She's got her father's inbox. That's an Amy Grant reference. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a fundraising motivator. Um, it's more well, I guess the fear is, you know, is this the America you think God will bless? An America that that kills its own children, you know, that that but, sacrifices children to Moloch. The part that I don't get is there was widespread abortion in this country before 1973, before Roe. I mean, in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, there was abortion in this country. So a lot of— Okay. It wasn't uh, legal and accepted and and socially—it was legal in the 19th century. Yeah. But in the 20th century, it was largely illegal and not socially acceptable. But a lot of people look back— at the 18th and 19th century as, you know, the golden age when God blessed America and there was manifest destiny and on and on and on, and there was abortion. So, yeah. I, and here's the other question, and this might be to answer your, your point, Christian. For 40, 50 years, we saw Roe be used as that major motivator for the conservative Republican Party. Has that now just shifted where it isn't, let's make sure we get the right justices on the Supreme Court, therefore we need the right president. Is it shift now to we need a national ban on abortion, which can only be passed by Congress? Therefore, we need to elect the right senators, the right Congress leaders, and the right president in order to pass an actual ban. In other words, it shifts from the Supreme Court to the Congress. And that's the new kind of brass ring we're chasing after. Yeah, uh, that would be interesting. I d- okay, here's my question. So there's an attempt right now to make... Uh, 
Mephistone, Mephistone, the, the abortion medication, illegal. And one judge in Texas actually made that ruling that the FDA shouldn't have approved it, and he's going to overrule the FDA's approval of Mephistone. Then there's another federal judge that says, no, I overrule your overruling. And so now that has to go to an appeals court, and then it's going to go to the Supreme Court. But here's the deal. Uh, about 75% of Americans are opposed to making that drug illegal. About 75% of Americans, uh, in some polls, more. So it's, it seems like we are, um, conservative Christians, are more and more trying to get laws passed that are wildly unpopular <laughs> yeah. with, with the broader culture um, because they're, you know, it was, this is the way it should be and this is what Christian America should look like. And the only way you can really do that, even if you get it, even if you find, you know, if you can stack a, a, the Supreme Court or get more conservative judges, all that can be overturned. You know, and in the future, by an electorate that is becoming increasingly hostile towards your values because they feel like you've, you know, you're you're going against the will of the people mm -hmm. to change or try to turn America back to, you know, your right. vision of America. So when when does that really start biting? That you know, a smaller and sm a shrinking demographic, a white conservative Christians are trying to exert significantly more influence than their numbers would imply. The, the problem is that they are trying to solve a problem with legislation that can only be solved with persuasion. And that will bite them eventually. You need to persuade more people in this culture to, to not see abortion as a viable option and give them alternative options. But instead of doing that, they're trying to pass legislation that makes it unavailable. There's a difference between banning something and ending something. We have banned illicit drugs for a long, long time. It hasn't ended the use of illicit drugs. You can ban abortion. It's not going to end abortion. So even if you did pass a nationwide ban, you women would still have abortions. We, If we really want to end it, you need a holistic approach that is more than just legislation. And that's the part that I think a lot of these political warriors and these culture warriors are missing. Yeah. I think that's a very wise word. Yeah. And, and I also wonder, you know, I mean, what if the right and the left had gotten together on this and said, okay, could we agree on a 10-week ban? You know, could we agree on a 12-week ban or a proposal? What have we negotiated? And the and what you hear from both sides, unfortunately, is that's, you know, that's negotiating with evil. You right. know, that's negotiating like the right can't negotiate because that's killing children and the left can't negotiate because it's taking all the rights away from women. So no one, so it, it's become, it's like, I don't know if there are other issues that are quite like this, but it literally is a zero-sum game issue where either you win it all or you lose it all. That's it. Well, so either the right wins everything or the left wins everything, which means you can't actually come up with a solution that people are okay with, even if they're not thrilled about, which means you're going to be in this conflict indefinitely. Yeah, but Phil, the, the way our politics works to be rather cynical about it, is yeah. there's no political... That's so unlike you, Sky. I know. I object. I, know. I okay. have to play to form here. <laughs> there's no political advantage in a solution. Because if you actually solve a problem, it's no longer on the on the table as an issue you can motivate people with. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, it's sad, but this has been an argument used on both sides for a while. Like, if you... If you really solve the problem of abortion, then neither party has it anymore to bludgeon the other one with. Yeah. Um, and that's true of a number of issues. Um, and it's not just the Republicans, the Democrats do this too, where they want the issue alive so they can what, use it to motivate if, and frighten their, their constituents. What if the goal of our interactions in politics weren't to bludgeon the people? 
What if that wasn't the goal? What you if, mean it if, was, if it was actually solving problems and helping yeah, the country I'll, flirt? Yeah, that oh, would be nice. Oh, Phil, you're <laughs> such a dreamer. Didn't you learn Christian. that you should just let your dreams die? Christian. You shouldn't be chasing after <laughs> dreams. I read your book. I read it. I read don't, it. You Don't, don't put make it on that idols footing. of your dreams. Don't put it on that footing. I just, there's, ah, I'm, it's okay. just driving me crazy a little bit. Can do you mind if I go back a little bit and just yes. dig into something? Go. You said something about how the Christians feel like in order for us to be, you know, blessed by God, our nation to be, be blessed by God, we need to eradicate these things, whether it's, you know, abortion or um any of the transgenderism, trans transgender mm -hmm. gender items, you know, homosexuality, et cetera, et cetera. I am wanting to think about where that idea comes from, that if we behave a certain way, do a certain thing, God is going to bless us and then we'll be all hunky-dory. And I'm wondering, <laughs> that's what I'm wondering, are they saying that we, uh, we're we comparing ourselves to Exodus? We are the Israelites, and it's very clear if we obey God's rules, we'll be blessed. If we disobey God's rules, we'll be cursed. And yeah. And that's where it comes from? Yeah. Uh, yes yeah. and yes and no. I mean, there is, we've talked about it before. There's a long, long, long tradition of comparing the United States to Israel and have a special covenant and God's blessings and promises and the threat of curses and all that from the Old Testament are applied to America. That's certainly there. But there's another kind of more pragmatic one, which is the belief that God's commands and instructions are just good and righteous and true for all people. And the, the closer to which you adhere to them, the more likely you are to experience a good, blessed, flourishing community. It's better to have a community where laws are enacted that are just and fair, right? That's just true, regardless of whether you're Christian or not. Um, it's better to have a society in which you know, children grow up and have enough to eat and are educated. That's just true. And so there are some people who I think in, in with the best of motives and good intentions argue, hey, we should just follow what God says because, not because it's some supernatural blessing that will be given upon us, but it's just better. It's just good. And I think that's fair. That's legitimate. But I think too often it is the other one. It's the more magical thinking that if we just get these yeah. laws off our books, God will be happy. And it's the how stupid do you think God is argument that he'll look down and see this and bless us. Well, and it doesn't make any sense that if you read the Bible and if you believe it, that, you know, everything's going to magically be wonderful here and now. I mean, if they believe the Bible, then it's not going to end well necessarily. Yeah, I mean, I, so why I, are they thinking they can make heaven here on earth now? Because uh, they switch back to post millennialism. I'm not exactly, although there is a movement, the Reconstruction movement of of Rush Dooney and all his followers are did switch back to post millennialism. I have learned and now believe they need to bring in a Christian kingdom on earth now under our control before Jesus will come back. So there is actual eschatological shifts that have happened in the last 50 years um, in some circles that are doing that. Having said, I was going to say something else, and it was so, so, so smart, and I don't remember what it was, but it was, it was going to be good. I just don't know how we can get anything done if we've decided that 100% uh, that of my way is the only morally acceptable outcome in a democracy. It, it just That's shuts. why democracy itself has to go, Phil. We have to get rid of it. It I is know, ungodly I and know. unbiblical. And, I, and, then, and then, hey, that brings us to our next story. But then I wonder, okay, so if we get rid of democracy, if we get rid of, you know, one person, one vote, we throw that away, who decides who's calling the shots? Now, why do we assume that it'll be people like me? that will then call the shots. Because old white men like you, Phil, have been calling the shots in this country for a long time. Yeah, look around. Why Why are old white men like me feeling uncomfortable? Because the country doesn't look like us anymore. So why do we <laughs> assume 
that, hey, all of our new, young, not less, less white, half white, quarter white, no white neighbors, why are they going to say, okay, let's get rid of democracy, but make that guy in charge because he looks like the pictures in the White House. Why would they say that? Mm-hmm. Good question. I don't think they will. I don't think they will. I just, I listen to people on both sides arguing with equal moral conviction that their side must triumph because it's the American way or the Christian way. I think we're giving up on the American way to a certain extent and, and replacing it with the Christian way, which is just weird for Well, it doesn't Christians. matter. I mean, both sides are saying that, whether it's Christians or non-Christians, everybody is equally, you know, in that camp. It yeah. Did, you know, it doesn't matter what side you're on. And we we have already talked about this a million times. There really is no solution to this on a grand scale <sighs> immediately. You know, we can only do what we can do on a small level. And Phil, yeah. if I was to ask you, which I have in the past, how does this make a difference? How can I take what you're saying? How can I take this reality and use it in my own personal life in order to try to move yeah. the ball down the field? What's your advice? Well, it depends on the issue. Um, with abortion, you know, it's just pointing out how relative, unless you're Catholic, the view that there is no permissible situation where an abortion, you know, might be the lesser of two evils, as Billy Graham referred to it. If there's no situation where abortion is the lesser of two evils, um, that is a relatively new idea in America in particular, you know, and the, like up through Billy Graham and, and currently the National Association of Evangelicals all believe there are situations where it is uh, an abortion may be the lesser of two evils, not that it is an evil, but that losing the life of a mother or certain circumstances like rape and incest may be a greater evil than a very, 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 very early term um, abortion. So... But now it's gotten to the point where if you even bring that up, that like, you know, well, that was the position of Billy Graham just 20 years ago. It's like, well, obviously he was immoral. Obviously he he didn't believe in God. Or, and I just like, well, seriously? Seriously? It's like, it's like young earth creationism where you point out 100 years ago, almost no fundamentalists believed the earth was 6,000 years old. And they say, well, that's because they were all wrong. And they were, they were uh, con conflicted and compromised by the culture. But now we're not. Now we're not compromised by the culture anymore. Now we've, we're reading the Bible, the plain reading. I, I think you're right, Phil, but I think there's two issues here. Just One, say that again. Say that again, Sky. You are right, Phil. Thanks, Sky. But I think there's two issues here. And you've articulated one of them, which is on any particular issue, whether it's young earth creationism, abortion, whether it's guns, you pick it. Like, am I willing to hold that with some uh, charity? Am I willing to re acknowledge that maybe I haven't got it all? That's one issue. But then the other issue, let's say you have 100% moral certainty on your position. Fine. The second question is, am I permitted to share my country with people that may disagree with my position? Is that tolerable? And that's the part that scares me more. We have always had people in this country who have very, very strong views on you name it, but they've also generally, not always, but generally been willing to share this country or share their state or share their community with people who hold another view. That's what's changing. It isn't anymore that, oh, I have 100% certainty on abortion. It's I will not tolerate the existence of those in power who disagree with me. This mm -hmm. is what led to the Civil War. The South said, we have a view about white supremacy and, and slavery, and we are no longer willing to tolerate our sisters and brothers in the North who disagree with us. Therefore, we're going to break away and be our own country. And that led to the death of hundreds of thousands of Americans, not to mention the aftermath of the Civil War and Jim Crow and all the other stuff. And we are on a trajectory to do that again, because enough Americans are saying, not only am I right, but I am not willing to tolerate living and sharing a land with those who disagree with me. That is frightening. Yeah, yeah. And, and I interact with quite a few people, you know, that will kind of flirt with that idea. What we need now is a national divorce, including yeah. Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's sitting in Congress saying that. Um, what none of them can actually come up with is a way that that would even be remotely possible. You know, how right. exactly, how, how does Texas go with the red states while Austin, Houston, Dallas, and El Paso all, and San Antonio all want to stay with the blue states? 
and, and most of the ac- economic activity is in the blue counties of America, not in the red counties. So it's just a, it's just a freaking mess. It's a non-starter, and yet it's it, we're so, um, we're so unwilling to compromise with our neighbors on you know a whole set of it's, it's a shelf of issues that we've decided are not up for discussion, and mm-hmm. we keep adding new ones to the shelf, which makes it even harder to get along. Is like, wow, now look how many issues we have up there. Gun control, abortion, uh, uh, drag queen story hour is now up on the shelf. Uh, gender affirming care for minors is up on the shelf. Um, w- women, Men competing in women's sports is up on the shelf. And, and it's not just that, like, we really disagree on these issues, but I cannot live in a nation right. that isn't taking my position on these issues. Right. And that, it's like, where, what, what, what cliff have you talked yourself, what ledge have you talked yourself out onto, and what are you going to do next? Christian. I had a friend that was super angry about people putting their pronouns in their uh, signatures in yeah. their emails. Yeah. You know, I mean, down to that, like, I don't, don't even want to talk to that person if they're going to put, you know, sign their emails like that. So I want to make a proposition. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> All we can do is, as a people, make sure we individually are being the ones to compromise and to do what you are saying, Phil. We can sit here and talk about this all day long, and everyone that's listening already knows this argument is happening in our country. And so really, what is in our power to do? You know, it's to listen to what you're saying on a small level and get involved on a bigger level and model that for our children, Mm -hmm. more importantly, and for our neighbors and for those in our schools. So if you're listening to this today, think about your own life. Where are you demonstrating a lack of charity with other people? Does it make you angry when you see somebody that has pronouns in their signature? What little things rile you up? How can you be more um, open-minded and charitable to those who disagree with you? Yeah. That's my, that's my proposition and my uh, challenge. Amen today. to that. Amen to that. I'll, I'll add something. And, you know, I don't want to say it's wrong to have really strong convictions about everything. It's I do not a lot of things, but I do have on some things, and that and that means what do you do with those things you won't compromise on, and that's exactly where the brilliance of the American system and other, you know, more modern post enlightenment liberal democracies have some brilliance to them is it creates an environment in, where we are free to try to persuade our fellow citizens of the 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 strength of our ideas. And that's why we have freedom of speech. That's why we have elections. That's why we have limited government. That's why we have all these protections in our society. So if there's something you are convinced is absolutely essential, what's wrong is to, is to bypass those structures of persuasion and storm the Capitol violently. What's wrong is to say, well, I'm now justified in murdering my opponent. What's wrong is to now say, well, you can no longer get a vote because you disagree with me. Play by the rules of the game. Try to persuade your fellow citizens using your speech, using your pen, using your vote, and out of love and compassion, make the best case you possibly can to win them to your side. That's what our system allows you to do. That in many other countries, you can't. But when you say, I'm not going to accept the outcome of that election, or I'm not going to give you a vote, or I'm going to silence you with with cancel culture and all that, you are destroying the boundaries and the the rules of the game we've lived by for 250 years that has made the improvements we've seen in this country. And that's what scares me so much about what I'm seeing, particularly on the political right, is they're basically saying, we don't want to play by the rules of democracy anymore because we just want to win it all. That's what's truly frightening. Yeah. And on um, the last story I wanted to cover was a a good piece in the New Yorker entitled, How How Christian is Christian Nationalism? And if you have access to the New Yorker, we'll link to it. I'd recommend reading it because it's a good survey from a staff writer at the New Yorker of um, Gorski and Perry and, and Perry and Whitehead and, and um, Stephen Wolf. So he kind of went through all the most recent writing on Christian nationalism. And one of the conclusions that he pulls out for the readers of the New Yorker 
is um, the conclusion that for many people, Christian in America is now referring less to theology and more to heritage. And then it's becoming almost similar to the idea of being Jewish in America, that being Jewish doesn't necessarily mean you're practicing. It means that's your heritage. It's what you grew up in. It's what your grandparents were. Um, he says more than a fifth of respondents who wanted the government to declare the U.S. a Christian nation also describe themselves as being secular or an adherent to a non-Christian faith. Uh, paradoxically, so did more than 15% of self-identified Christians. Okay, more than 15% of self-identified Christians also said they were secular or not Christian. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're, they're, they were, they're nominal cultural Christians. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. nuns. They're, they're unaffiliated, but right. they're Christian because that's their heritage. And uh, so another way to look at the, the Christian nationalist movement really is, you know, Stephen Wolf, who wrote The Case for Christian Nationalism, just tweeted yesterday a, a, the classic um, Norman Rockwell painting of the, the white working class guy standing up in an assembly, you know, to raise his hand and speak. It's the freedom of speech. Uh, painting, his famous painting, and said, and said, no one is doing more to uphold the moral bedrock of America than white evangelicals. You know, that the, we're the ones, the white evangelicals are the ones that are keeping America together. And which led a lot of people to saying, hey, that sounds a little bit racist. And other, <laughs> you know, people to say, of course, of course, that's true. Of course we are. Um, but it's becoming more about culture mm -hmm. than about theology and we don't like how the culture is changing. The theology, in hindsight, isn't that important to us as much as my America. See, and that makes me wonder if you, okay, what, what is different about my posture if, like, I was a missionary to China, okay, my family lives in China, we're missionaries, we're there to tell people about Jesus. Wow, I really don't like some of the policies of the Chinese government. I can't live here anymore. I don't like these policies. I'm going to set the government buildings on fire. I'm going to storm the Capitol. In, no, you would say, I'm a missionary here. I'm not, who says I'm supposed to like the policies? So what's the difference between me being in America and me being China, except for this sense in my head that America was supposed to be different from the beginning, um, and China isn't. So that's what I want to boil down to is like, why do we have that sense and why can't we let go of it? Why can't we actually accept America for what it is rather than for some sense that we've built with bad history on what it was supposed to be and just say, hey, I'm a missionary here, just like if I lived in China and I'm not going to like everything that goes on, but that's not why I'm here. This Christian. is going to be such a surprise to you, Phil. Yeah. We are being programmed by TikTok, we are being, by AI, by, <laughs> by, by news organizations, by social yeah. media, by, and the flames are being stoked every day. They're stoking I my know. flames. It's shocking, yeah. shocking, isn't it? <laughs> well, I, I, you're right, Christian. There's no doubt that that's a big factor in it. But I think the message that we're really here's the difference. If you're a missionary in China let's say you're a Western missionary in China, your primary allegiance is to Christ and his kingdom. Your primary allegiance is not to the Chinese government or even to the country of China. Whereas uh -huh. when you are a white American Christian in the United States, I think an argument can be made that for many of those people, their highest allegiance is to the United States. It's not to Jesus. And therefore, when they see the United States going in a way they don't like, it gets this visceral response in a way that it wouldn't if their highest allegiance was truly to Jesus, where their instinct would be more, okay, well, this is the land I find myself in. These are the people I am called to love and serve. I will continue to do that regardless mm -hmm. of what's happening in Washington, D.C. That's It's about identity and allegiance. And, and I also think that we have this false sense of that we have control. We have this false sense that I have control and I can make this happen. I can make this country be what I want it to be. You know, we can take over the capital. Mm -hmm. We can turn the tide. We can take power back. It's this fierce independence that we can, you know, change our stars. And, you know, the thing that's just curious to me, and I can never get my head around this, is in the 80s, we felt like we were this 
tiny minority of people that were coming together. And we had these amazing beliefs and value systems, but we really were this little minority, right? And why do so we call it sh- the moral majority? <laughs> <laughs> because morally, morally we were right, but we still had this like zeitgeist of being this really yeah. small group of people that were always oppressed by the liberal elite and blah, blah, blah. But now in practicality, like what surprises me is that we're at least half of the country. Who is? I mean, or the right, the conservatives. Oh, okay. the, do you I mean, know what I mean? Here's what's crazy. Or the, to- even the Christian, you know. Yeah. He, Christians are less than half or, or, or will be in another decade. But, but I don't necessarily, uh, I don't mean, sorry, I don't mean Christians by like saying they're Christians. I mean, yeah. sort of politically. Your, your point, okay. Christian, though, is really important. That that entitlement sense that you know, we have the right to do this. I mean, think about it this way. I think you could make a case that there has been no group that has suffered more persecution and injustice over the last 500 years than African-Americans. I mean, Native Americans for sure, but African Americans in a prolonged, systemic, horrific way, enslavement, captivity, Jim Crow, you go on down the list. And yet in that 500 years of deep injustice and persecution, there was never a mob of black Americans who rioted on the Capitol and felt justified in overtaking Capitol Hill. And yet one election happens where a group of white Christian Americans with no evidence are convinced that this election was stolen from them and they felt completely justified in destroying the Capitol building and going and raiding it. And to this day are still saying they were justified in what they did. What kind of warped perception of entitlement do you have to have to do that? If anyone had a right to do that, it was black Americans and they'd never done that. So that's how warped a sense of entitlement can affect your behavior when one perceived slight is justified in overwhelming force in retaliation, but centuries of true injustice and there's no justification and no entitlement to do that. It's just so bizarre to me, but that's where that comes from is, no, this is my country. I can do with it whatever I want. Yeah, there, And you yeah, can't stop a, me. There's a strong sense of this is the way it was supposed to be. This is right. the way it should be. And they're trying to make it a different way than the way it should be. And so I have the right to suspend the rules to make it the way it should yeah. be against the people that are following the rules, but making it the way it should not be. And you go back and you look at whether it's Martin Luther King Jr. or Frederick Douglass, a lot of these great voices of civil rights they appealed to the foundations of America. They appealed to the Declaration of Independence. They appealed to the Constitution to say, hey, let's live up to our ideals. And now there's a whole movement of white Christian nationalism saying, oh, wait a minute. The Constitution is not giving us what we want. Screw the Constitution. Let's get rid of democracy. Let's get rid of representation. Let's get... And it's like, this is insane. The moment it doesn't work out for white Christians, we're justified in scrapping the whole country whereas a true persecuted minority has actually tried to uphold the ideals of this country in order to make it better for everybody. Everything's crazy backwards. It's okay. just nuts. Okay. The, the, this is from the New Yorker piece. The January 6th protester who prayed in the Senate, for instance, was Jake Angeli, known as the QAnon shaman, um, who previously referred to himself as part of a, quote, light occultic force. During his prayer, Angeli thanked God for the, quote, divine, omnipresent white light of love and protection, peace and harmony. And then the New Yorker writer says, perhaps a shaman is the perfect figurehead for a movement defined by Christian heritage, not Christian faith. America may now be following the trajectory of Europe, where Viktor Orban, the prime minister of Hungary, talks about the importance of Christian roots, even though fewer than 20% of Hungarians attend church regularly. If the rise of Christian nationalism in America reflects the decline of Christianity, that is bittersweet news for secular liberals, because it means that they might expect to see more and more of it as the country grows less pious. So, Mm -hmm. and this is in the New Yorker, which is interesting. They're saying, you know, that this is a big problem because Christian nationalism rising might be a sign of Christianity declining, and it's becoming more of a cultural force than a theologically meaningful one. Totally. I mean, this is what Jesus and John Wayne was all about. And oh, we're just we're man. seeing the the fruit of it now. Oh, Christian, we're in trouble. Christian, we're in trouble. We we are. It just makes me super super sad. 
Oh, Super man. sad. Maybe you'll get. So a call. I don't want to. I don't want to. You don't want to end this way. You don't want to end this way. No, I don't want to end this way. You know what this? Do you know where this leaves us? Exactly Please. where every other Christian in the world is living in a country that isn't wasn't necessarily set up to cater to your comfort, and still following Jesus just fine. It's okay. I can mm-hmm. follow Jesus in China. I can follow Jesus in India. I can follow Jesus in Berkeley, California, or Austin, Texas, or Dallas. It's a little messier in Dallas because of some crazy uh, megachurch pastors. But I can follow Jesus wherever I am, and I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to kick my neighbor out of the neighborhood to follow Jesus. Do you know what my good friend Sarah Murdoch says? No, she was on our show a long time ago. Whenever I start to sound like you were just sounding, Phil, she just texts me every now and then, eyes up, Pooh Bear, eyes up. And what that means, that's kind of our little, you know, she calls me Pooh Bear because I'm a bear of little, very little brain at times. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> as we all know. But but what it reminds me is that if we have our eyes fixed on ourselves, fixed on the here and now, fixed on all of the problems, we're going to feel that way. Our spirit and our soul is going to make us feel that way. But we can't live there. We have to cast our eyes up on Christ and the hope that he sets before us. And so I want to not only challenge you guys like I did earlier, but encourage you today. If you're feeling the weight of this conversation, the weight of what's going on in your schools or your neighborhoods, um, keep your eyes up and be hopeful. Have hope. You know, our destiny isn't here and now in the United States, and our lives are not going to end with the next election. Right, because if your eyes 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 are always down on your phone, you can't see Jesus, and you're going to run into a a stoplight. Or so, a poll. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, the hope in all this is as, as, the, as the counterfeit Christianity continues to grow, it makes the real thing that much more obvious. And I'm not, I'm not worried about that. Good all point. right, guys. We have a great interview, a fantastic interview. We actually do. Gonna, oh, we actually do this time. Mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. not lying this time, mm-hmm. Sky says. You're going to enjoy it. Thank you, Patreon supporters, for all your support. I did a, I did a, a two-part interview with the guy who wrote about dispensationalism that's coming up, not today, but in a couple of weeks, I think. You're really going to like it. So I'm excited about that one already. Hey, and guess what? What? I think Christian... Asks is back this week. It There's is. There's a Christian ask this week. There's a Christian asks. I hey, everyone, K. honestly, good. we have like a boatload of new stuff for supporters of the Holy Post. And rather than rattle through all that's available right now, you just, you need to go to the Holy Post website and sign up for the free newsletter because that's going to start going out and you'll get, you'll see all the new stuff that's coming that's and right. all. Yeah, so go to holypost.com, put your name in for that free newsletter and you'll, you'll see it. Yeah, we've had a sign-up spot for a free newsletter on our website for about five years. We've never had a newsletter. But now we do. (laughs) It's like a little inside joke. But now we do. So it's heading your way. Go sign up. Okay, thanks, y'all. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, everybody. This episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Haya Health. Hey, do you have kids? Do you care about their health? Of course you do. Most kids' vitamins are basically candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk kids really shouldn't be eating. That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin for kids. Zero sugar, zero gummy junk, yet they taste great and are perfect for picky eaters. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diet to provide the full body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you need to go to HayaHealth.com slash Holy Post. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash Holy Post and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into health. The adults. And thanks to Haya Health for sponsoring this episode.
Today's episode is sponsored by Sundays. This is Phil. I have a dog. You have a dog. We love our dogs and we gotta feed them something. Fresh food with human grade ingredients is a better way to treat our dogs than that old bag of whatever that stuff is. Sawdust and cow bones? I have no idea. But fresh pet food is expensive and inconvenient. And that's where Sundays comes in. No, not the day. The new dog food company that makes air dried dog food from a short list of human grade ingredients. It's healthy with beef, chicken, and digestive aid like pumpkin and ginger. It's convenient. Unlike other fresh dog foods, it's zero prep, zero mess, and zero stress. Sundays is shelf stable and ships right to your door. And it's affordable, costing 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because they don't waste money shipping frozen packages. We've got a special offer for our dog-loving holy posters. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash holypost or use the code holypost at checkout. That's Sunday sundaysfordogs.com forward slash holy post. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. And thanks to Sundays for sponsoring this episode. My guest today is John Ward. He's the chief national correspondent for Yahoo News, and he's covered American politics in Washington for 20 years, including the White House. He's traveled with George W. Bush and Barack Obama on Air Force One many times, and he's covered two presidential campaigns. John is one of my favorite and most trusted political reporters. He's been on The Holy Post twice before to discuss political history as well as trends in American politics. You can find those conversations on episode 295 and episode 335. But today, we're talking about something different. John's story about growing up in the 1980s and 90s within the white evangelical bubble. His new autobiography is called Testimony, Inside the Evangelical Movement That Failed a Generation. What you'll hear from John is someone who's critical of the subculture that raised him, but he's also grateful. As a gifted journalist, I think he's learned how to hold truths in tension, and that's very evident in his book. He's able to see the shortcomings and failures of the evangelical movement, but he hasn't overcorrected and concluded that Christianity itself is therefore untrue. In fact, his faith is stronger than ever, but it's also more mature and more holistic. In this conversation, we talk about some of the qualities that defined evangelicalism in the 80s and 90s and how that movement came to embrace the rise of Trump, which John saw from the inside as a reporter. And for Holy Post supporters, we have an exclusive bonus interview with John Ward where he talks about his 20 years as a journalist, how the profession has changed and not always for the better, what it was like working for Tucker Carlson early in his career, and why he thinks so many evangelicals distrust the media. So be sure to check that out on our Patreon page. And if you've not yet signed up to support The Holy Post, go to holypost.com and click support us at the top of the page. Okay, here is my conversation with John Ward. John Ward, welcome back to The Holy Post. Hey, Sky. It's good to see you. Congratulations on the new book. It's called Testimony Inside the Evangelical Movement That Failed a Generation. That's uh, You're kind of putting your cards on the table right there at the subtitle. Yeah, we did. We did. uh, We had a little bit of a debate about um, about the subtitle, which uh, um, the publisher came up with. And then, you know, we talked about using, uh, I think, corrupted a generation. And I felt like that was more malicious than failed. Mm. Um, I don't I don't ascribe a lot of malice to evangelicals. Um, I'm I'm more analyzing a culture that's grown up uh, with millions of inputs and decades of, of uh, time going into it and just a- trying to um, provoke uh, more analysis and, and thoughtful consideration of that culture and the systems and incentive structures inside it. I'm sure you're familiar with Kristen Kobes' Dumais book, uh, Jesus and John Wayne, which she writes as an academic, as a historian covering modern evangelicalism. And it felt as I read your book that it kind of covers some of the same ground, but as a autobiography, it's deeply personal and it's a, an intimate journey into that subculture that Dumay talks about. But you're giving it to us firsthand. And one of the thoughts that kept occurring to me, especially in the first half of your book, is this is going to sound horrible, but how grateful I am I didn't grow up in the evangelical bubble. Mm-hmm. I sort of had one foot in it because my mom had us connected to an evangelical church, but my dad is not a Christian. I, he's an immigrant. I, it's, I had a much more diverse upbringing. And so much of what you write about here is the culture in which you were formed as a boy. Mm-hmm. Um, so your parents came to faith through the Jesus movement in the 60s and 70s. And then your father was on staff with C.J. Mahaney at his church, which... 
early on was far more charismatic, then kind of got into the new Calvinism movement, the megachurch thing. As you look back on that journey, just of your church in those different eras of American evangelicalism, how do you explain the Jesus movement to charismatic movement to Calvinism? Like, what's the continuity there? How do you trace that? Big picture, I basically got an experience in two of the most dominant streams of evangelicalism over the last, you know, half century, I guess, um, and got an up close and personal taste of it. How that happened in our particular context, our congregation and our family of churches is a unique story and um, is part of the story I lay out here. Um, and so to kind of explain how that happened in the particulars is a very particular story because it just depends on the fact that my parents, uh, you know, came into the Jesus movement in the DC suburbs uh, along with a lot of their friends. And then, you know, in the mid nineties, there was this really strange, interesting period where you had the Toronto blessing and this, you know, outpouring of charismatic and Pentecostal expressions. And right after that, our church, I think largely because of CJ's relationships with people like Wayne Grudem and others on the Council for Biblical Manhood and women, Womenhood. Um, and at some point, Al Mohler enters the picture and Mark Dever. So there was this network of relationships that I think brought CJ and our church and our family of churches into the, what was called the New Calvinism. Um, and and so I think the first you know half of that story is kind of a cultural, you know, pr- pretty culturally common experience for a lot of younger Christians who were looking for something new at the time. And then the chapter in the mid nineties, I think just again, comes out of those relationships, but also, you know, as I explained, there were, there were leaders at our church early on who ended up staying in the charismatic stream who are now prominent in the new apostolic reformation movement. Um, And and I think it's just, it's kind of a personality difference between those leaders and CJ. Um, And I, we can get into that if you want, but I think those are some of the factors. One of the dynamics of the book that I wasn't prepared for is there's sort of a Forrest Gump-ishness to your story in that you, from a young age onward, encountered so many well-known Christian evangelical leaders, sometimes before they were well-known. C.J. Mahaney, you've already mentioned, Joshua Harris, who went on to write the I've Kissed Dating Goodbye book, has since left the faith. Um uh, throughout the book, there's a lot of name dropping. And it's not name dropping like, look how cool I am. I know these people. It's name dropping in that you were deeply enmeshed in that formative culture of American evangelicalism. What impact did that have on you? The, the, the celebrity nature of Christian leadership that you were in and around and what's your perspective on it now? Well, honestly, I didn't, because we were in some, some sort of bubble I don't think I thought of a lot of these people as celebrities because I didn't, when you're in a small, smaller universe, you don't usually, and this is before social media. So I think it was harder than to, to really know like how well known are these people. Um, So, you know, I, I was a couple years younger than Josh, but we knew that he was a popular speaker at some large conferences. Um, But, you know, I think even now, like, it's not until you start really looking at polling numbers uh, and, and you know surveys of the religious landscape that you begin to get a sense of how large are these movements, how many people are we talking about. Um, and I, I guess to me, I never was really that impressed with celebrity inside a bubble. I always kind of wanted to know, like, how much does this really matter? How many, how much do people outside this subculture really think about these people or know of them? Um, in, in describing that bubble, that subculture, you make the comparison to Gnosticism, mm. this ancient Christian heresy, which, for those who aren't familiar, uh, essentially emphasizes the immaterial and downplays this material world in our bodies. Uh, and you say this Gnosticism is fueled by the evangelical evangelical obsession with euphoria because emotional highs are understood as obedience to God, and it's virtually impossible to live in the real world while riding a wave of spiritual ecstasy. So talk about how your understanding of Gnosticism and its and, and how that became an interpretive lens through which you understood your upbringing. What were other ways that that manifested itself in the community you were a part of? Yeah, and the other factor, I think, that fuels that sort of Gnosticism is um, 
the the premillennialist uh, dispensationalism, which which I think is the sort of the intellectual part of it that um, encourages people to think of the physical realm and the world in which we live and and the life that we're living now as far less important than the life to come, um, and in some ways unimportant. But the emotionalist factor. Um, you know, grew out of the Jesus movement and and our church, as we've already you mentioned, you know, when I was twenty, they were embracing Calvinism. So they merged uh, an expressionist, uh, you know, uh, form of religion with a theology that was very introspective and focused on indwelling sin. But that expressionist emotional element meant that just as my for my my parents had this very very meaningful. And, and transformative experience in the seventies um, where, you know, the Jesus movement revival brought them together, gave them a sense of purpose. They had several years in which they were, you know, young, um, idealistic um, and living in a faith community where there was just a huge sense of unity and purpose and all of these things. And so that model for authentic faith um, continued into when I, you know, when I was in my twenties. And so to be a faithful Christian meant to, meant that you were supposed to have strong emotions for God. And the way you did that was through worship services. But I also would, you know, like some others would try to sustain that level of emotional experience on my own, in my own room, not just through Bible study or prayer, but through actually like singing, um, and as I looked back on this period, you know, I realized that if that is one of your metrics for success as a Christian to have a, a high level of emotional intensity about God or Christ or religion or faith or church, um, it makes it very difficult to walk the road that Christ, the way that Christ calls his followers to walk, which is you know, often not inside a church building, but often in the margins of society, helping those who um, need help and uh, moving into areas of life and into your community and into the world, um, the broken places um, to to bring the love of God and to be the hands and feet of Christ. It's very hard, I think, to and, and I and I felt the lack of that in the church as I was in my college years, um, but could not figure out because there really wasn't a lot of mechanisms to do it, how to make that happen. Um, and, uh, but it, it was in looking back that I realized that if the, the goal is intense emotionalism, it kind of forces a choice. You either move out of that church bubble into those spaces and your faith begins to take on a different form, I think, or you, withdraw into a, a life in which most of your your time is spent going to church meetings um, and seeking that uh, that form of religion, that form of experience. Uh, staying on this theme of, of the Gnostic influence of, of the evangelical subculture, the emotionalism of it, the anti-worldliness uh, of it, the escapism, I think you and I are almost the same age. You might be a year younger than me, but you describe as a teenager and young adult, the incredible emphasis that was put on sexual purity in that season of your life yeah. and the accountability groups that you had. And, you know, this was, we, we were both probably graduating high school and entering college on the, in the early years of the internet and the explosion of internet pornography and all of this was going on. How do you reconcile the, the general Gnostic attitude of the church culture that said the material world doesn't matter. It's all about emotionalism and feelings while at the same time putting in an extraordinary amount of emphasis on bodily purity and physical purity and sexual purity as the end all be all of one's holiness. Have you thought much about how those live together or why they could exist together? I haven't thought about that linkage or contrast philosophically too much. Um, and I will say there's no pictures in the book, but I am kind of, I'm doing a narrative, a chronological narrative on Instagram at uh, an account called Testimony of the Book. And and I've got a picture up just today of me getting baptized at age 20 
And the next post, we'll get into some of the stuff you talk about, about accountability groups and the effect of that. Um, But I think probably my suspicion is that some of the answers for the focus on sex um, came from some of the factors that Kristen laid out in her book, um, which are very cultural, historical, political. Um, You know, uh, Karen Swallow Pryor's uh, book coming out this summer talks about how Victorian culture um, shaped a lot of evangelicalism. And I haven't read <clears throat> all a lot of that, but that's early on in the book that she talks about that. So I think there are, you know, decades, centuries long influences that um, that shaped a lot of the way that evangelicals have focused on sex in these ways. Um, and I, you know, I do think that there is <clears throat> some linkage here between the ways that white evangelicalism, conservative evangelicalism, um, is so hyper individualistic um, and lacks a real focus on community. Um, and so th- these concerns of sexuality, uh, I think, do take up some of the space that in, for example, the black church are taken up with concerns about um, social justice and community involvement. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, last thing on this sort of Gnostic uh, bifurcation of of the tradition. You talk a lot about the anti-intellectualism, the lack of curiosity, the the form of education that you received, especially when you were younger, that was more about teaching kids what to think, not how to think. And how when you graduated high school, you went on to community college and then the University of Maryland, that sort of began to break. You You began to enter a larger world. Explain how your journey toward journalism ended up changing your perspective on your faith from the one you had received as a kid. Epistemology, the study of how we know what we know, is like a a topic that just endlessly fascinates me. And um, I think, you know, like I'm I'm going to the National Public Radio building later today to do an interview and, um, I was just thinking about, you know, the environment in places like that and how it's such a contrast to a lot of religious conservative environments. And I, and I was, I was actually thinking about how I think a lot of the cultural difference between sort of secular progressives or even religious progressives, usually in urban areas and religious conservatives, usually in suburban or rural areas. um, I do think there's a huge epistemological um, contrast. It's just people think differently about how to acquire knowledge um, and how to apply knowledge to life. <clears throat> and so I'm pretty comfortable going into, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm pretty comfortable going into an NPR building because I know the epistemological code or the, 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 the culture there. It's basically the, the, the culture of journalism. But it's, it, I think it's off-putting and intimidating to a lot of people who don't know that world. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a roundabout way to say journalism really trained me in being skeptical of, of what um, – of two things. What we can't prove and uh, the limits of our, of our own knowledge um, and just the fact that uh, – you know, there's often a lot that we're getting wrong, and it's important to be looking for those things and not just <clears throat> sort of gliding past them and assuming that you know most of what we think is right. Um, and <clears throat> it also, I think, that gave me an appreciation for the uh, the rigor um, with which we should seek to find out what's true, what's false, and what's somewhere in between. And I think that somewhere in between is also something that um, uh, maybe religious folks are, are a little uncomfortable with because there's a desire to kind of nail things down into those true and false categories when, in fact, a lot of life is lived um, in a state of uncertainty about um, how, how, <clears throat> how much of life actually does fit into either one of those boxes. Yeah, that's something that comes out clearly in the book as you're describing those years of your journey and then journalism in general, what you grew up with was a system that tried to emphasize simplicity. There are simple answers out there. And as you develop, you realize, wait a minute, the things I was told were really simple, black and white, are a lot more complicated than we've been led to believe. And that complication is 
it's toxic to people from a conservative Christian environment where they want control, they want simple answers. Um, can I can I just add one more thing to that? I think yeah, absolutely. Talk about deconstruction. It's possible though that when people coming from a faith background, you know, quote unquote, deconstruct, they're moving from a uh, religious point of view to a, um, a skeptical point of view without incorp- without merging the two. Sometimes it seems as if people look back on the o- the oversimplified version of faith they were taught and think that. Well, because it was so oversimplified and anti-intellectual, then it you know none of it can be true, and and I'm not coming from that place at all. Right, and, and that's one of the things that's really rewarding about your book is it's it's obviously a very honest, transparent story of your journey, but you're not. It doesn't feel like you're overcorrecting. Like the pendulum didn't swing super far the other direction, where it becomes an entirely reactionary book. Um, it's it feels like a book of maturing and development and understanding the nuances and complexities that were you were unaware of as a younger man. Um, to that end, one of the more uh, fascinating parts as you get later in the story is your sort of on the ground real time reporting on the Trump phenomenon. And you had been reporting on politics for a while at that point from the Bush administration through the Obama administration, and you were there for the uh, early rise of, of the Trump movement. And like many other people, you express kind of shock over the eventual evangelical embrace. I want to read a part of your book. This is from page 158. You're describing getting an email from someone you knew or a colleague or a friend of a colleague from the Federalist who was expressing outrage that Christian conservative leaders were endorsing Trump. And I think it was in fall of 2016, by this point, he'd already secured the nomination. And this is what the email said that you received. Quote, I'm so appalled by the behavior of so-called Christian leaders in this country that I can barely see straight. The religious right, and by that I mean the men who sought to make the Christian church, a subsidiary of the GOP, has done more to corrupt and destroy the Christian church in this country than any single person or group on the left. More than government, more than progressives, more than Democrats, more than atheists. They are the single most corroding agent in Christianity today. End quote. That's the email you received. And then you write, a few short years later, this person would become a fierce defender and supporter of Trump. All right. You get into it with your family in the book. You talk about the the warnings you issued from someone on the inside about Trump and how it kind of fell on deaf ears. I'm sure a lot of our audience, I mean, we the question we get probably, I'd say second most from our audience is how do I deal with family members who are completely bought into the MAGA cult? Um, how do you, looking back, explain the evangelical embrace of Donald Trump? What I mean, there's a lot of nuance to that, but what for you has the most explanatory power and how somebody like that person who wrote that email can shift from this is the worst thing ever to embracing and supporter? Uh, I don't think there's any one answer. I mean, for for some people, it's economic incentives and job security. <clears throat> um, for a lot of people who are not in that boat, um, it was a process of uh, revulsion at Trump, which then turned to resignation when he became the nominee, which then turned to, uh, rationalization. Um, and, um, the th- I'm doing a good job of alliterating here. Um, <laughs> and, and after rationalization, they were sort of in the camp. Um, and I think a lot of that was just due to the fact that, um, political action and involvement is very identity based and ego involved. And um, once, you know, it turns into an R versus D general election, um, the discomfort that a lot of people had with Trump was overtaken. So I would say their faith, often faith-driven concerns were overtaken by their political identity. And their political identity sort of took the wheel and they put on their Republican jersey um, and, you know, engaged in politics through that lens. It, it, if that's the case, I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, but it sounds like the reluctant Christian Trump supporter would 
abandon him when there's a legitimate alternative available or when there's something that occurs beyond the pale that they just can't go along with. You thought in the book, you write about how you thought January 6th was going to be that moment and you talk about your engagement with your family around it. Do you see any evidence of of the evangelical subculture really turning from Trump? Or is, uh, well, if not, how do you explain the fact that they haven't yet? Well, I don't think there's ever going to be any mass repentance. I just don't think that that's human nature. Um, you know, it would be the sign of a <laughs> maybe a revival to have, you know, and I'm not just necessarily saying it would have to apply to repenting from Trump. I'm just saying repentance is a sign of religious or spiritual revival, I think. But um, I think if evangelicals move on from Trump, it will be by virtue of the fact that somebody else has come along and offered them a better alternative. I think there is a period right now where a lot of people would prefer that he not be the nominee. Mm -hmm. But if he becomes the Republican nominee again, then that political identity will again obscure and overtake the religious identity, unfortunately. And I think that speaks to the lack of robust uh, training in evangelical culture in how to exercise public character as opposed to private character. On a personal level, like I said, you mentioned, you talk a lot about your family relationships in the book and how being a journalist on the inside and seeing what was going on and issuing warnings to them about what was happening and, and the conflict that created and the tensions it created. How did you navigate that? And how have you maintained your relationships uh, where there remain political differences over Trump and perhaps other issues? You know, it was a very, <clears throat> like many people, it was a very painful period, and the pain still exists in several relationships. Um, my dad has read the book um, and was not happy with a lot of it. He just disagreed with a lot of it. Um, but And he's in the book, and he's a favorable character in the book, and I pay a lot of tribute to him. Um, but I also do explain a few times where we disagreed. But I will say that one of the huge benefits of writing this book already has been that we have grown much closer as a result of talking through our disagreement. Um, and that's somewhat unique to the fact that I've said what I've said in a public way, which is not an outlet that, you know, is available to everyone. Um, and I think that got his attention. Um, and it's hard for me to know how that transfers to, you know, regular interpersonal relationships, because in many of those you know, even with him, I, you know, we've talked through the book, but I still have taken a stance where I don't really want to talk about politics with him because it doesn't produce um, anything pro of, of positive value, in, in my opinion. And it just makes me upset with him. Um, and, uh, and I'd rather just preserve our relationship. So it was harder to do that during the Trump years when everything felt much more existential. Um, and I suspect it will become harder again if Trump is the nominee or the president. Um, but I would say the thing I would do differently next time if I had to do it over again would be to just um, bite my tongue more often and, uh, and pick my battles and focus on um, relationship with people in my family and in my life who I want to be in a relationship with and um, and let others go if I feel like it's not worth pursuing. Because there are, you know, there are those two categories, I think. I, if you're going to stick around for a, a bonus conversation sure. for our Patreon supporters, I would love to talk to you more about the journalism side of this and why so many white evangelicals have this distrust of journalism. But before we wrap up this conversation, I want to talk about, I mean, your subtitle again is the evangelical movement that failed a generation. And there's a couple moments in the book where you succinctly identify the nature of that failure. And it's not Donald Trump. It's not just politics. It's not any of those things. But, uh, spoiler alert, I first really recommend everyone read this book because it's so well done. Um, but towards the end, you say this, I was taught a lot about the cross growing up, but I was not really shown how to take up my cross and actually follow Christ. The crisis of American Christianity basically boils down to this failure, the failure to learn how to actually take up your cross and follow Jesus. 
Um, how have you learned to take up your cross and follow Jesus? Really, I think the answer to that is that I've learned that it's mostly just a matter of stumbling forward and feeling like um, I'm not doing a very good job most of the time. But it's it's wrapped up in this idea of, um, I think, a lot of focus on uh, taking uh, the love of God and the love of Christ into the spaces where I have the most tangible impacts. That's in my family with my wife and my children, and it's in my local community and my neighborhood, and it's with my friends. And obviously, I, again, I do have an outlet in my writing um, that's not available to everyone. Um, but um, I think in real life, not the internet, it means trying to live a life that's characterized more by vulnerability and sacrifice. But I think the, the dual side of that coin that's a really interesting uh, dilemma is that I'm trying to walk that path without uh, seeking out suffering. I think that's a way that we can go overboard because life is going to bring us trials and tribulation and challenges on its own. Um, so it, I think it's looking for ways to, to serve and to sacrifice without, um, uh, without sort of going out of my way to be a martyr. Um, and, uh, and, and that does rely, I think that does involve a reliance on an active uh, dependence on, on listening to, uh, to God. Well, John, thank you for uh, being with us and for this book. It, it feels to me like uh, for those who don't want to read an academic history of the modern evangelical movement in America, your book offers a narrative biographical telling of that same story. Through your experience, we get a sense of where this movement came from and where it is, where it's going. And it's compellingly told and and very transparently told, and I can't recommend it enough. So thank you. Holy posters, you really need to pick up testimony inside the evangelical movement that failed a generation. And John, you're gonna stick around. We're gonna talk a little bit more about your experience as a journalist and kind of the erosion of that vocation to a certain degree, the trust in that vocation. You worked for Tucker Carlson for a little while. We'll get into some of that. So if you are a Holy Post supporter, you can get that bonus interview on our website. If you're not yet a supporter, go to holypost.com and click support us and you can get access to that along with a bunch of other bonus material. John Ward, thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thank you, Sky. Thanks for those kind words. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.